Hello and welcome to our Supporting Mental Health in the Workplace webinar. I'm Anita Mishra, I'm an employment partner at Clark's Legal and I'm joined today by Hannah Dolding from Mattioli Woods who will be talking to you about financial stress and productivity and I'm also joined by Ali Frentis from Super Wellness who will be talking to you about the role of nutrition in employees' mental health. So, for those of you viewing who are not already working with us and don't know us as an organisation, Clark's Legal is a full service commercial law firm. We are top ranked as a leading firm by the legal, legal directories and to complement our employment law practice, we have our HR subsidiary for Bree People, which is an HR and business consultancy providing additional HR and interim support. And also we have Employment Buddy, which is our online HR resource, in respect of which free and full subscriptions are available. If you'd like to discuss any of these services further with me, please get in contact and my contact details are at the end of the slides. So I'm going to be talking to you today about three broad issues, mental health generally in the workplace, legal duties secondly in respect of mental health and also practical steps that as employers we can take to support mental health in the workplace. So starting with mental health generally, so the correct way to view it is that we all have it and we can all fluctuate between the three phases that are shown up on the slides and that's thriving in work, struggling in work, and being ill and possibly off work. Which leads us to look at how this looks statistically. So one in almost seven people experience mental health problems in the workplace, and evidence suggests that almost 13% of all sickness absence days in the UK can be attributed to mental health conditions. Given these statistics, it's not surprising that it is really an issue that is now front and centre. So ACAS have published guidance in uh, autumn last year state, uh, for, in respect of promoting positive mental health in the workplace and the government have put it fairly central on their agenda with the Prime Minister last year acknowledging that lots is being done in this field already but that lots more can be done. As a result of this, the, the government commissioned the Stevenson and Farmer Review entitled Thriving at Work. It's a review of mental health and employers um, and that was at the end of last year as well. I will come back to how organisations are likely to be forced to engage with the topic of, in, of supporting their employees' mental health in the workplace, even if it's not something that they're already, already on board with now. And I'll come back to that towards the end of the presentation. So, moving on to the second area, which are the legal duties. So, Legal duties in respect of mental health in the workplace are broadly going to fall into three categories. The first of which is health and safety obligations. And that's because as employers, we have to assess the risks of mental ill health and for all of the staff arising out of work activities and take steps to effectively manage and control them. Secondly, we've got constructive unfair dismissal. This could come about as a result of very poor management of somebody who's, um, who is um, unwell uh, for mental ill health reasons. It could result in the poor management actually being a serious breach of the implied terms between employer and employee. And in response to that, an employee could resign, claim constructive dismissal and say it was unfair at that. And then finally, we've got disability discrimination, which is perhaps the biggest consideration when looking at mental ill health in the workplace. Um, disabilities can arise and illnesses, mental health illnesses, can arise gradually or suddenly and mental ill health can range from stress, anxiety, through to depression and more rare conditions such as bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Now how do we know if somebody meets the definition of being disabled for the purposes of the Equality Act? Well the definition is set out on the slide, it's a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial adverse effect on the ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities and by that we mean more than a small effect on everyday life and finally that it's long term and by that we mean that the condition has lasted 12 months or is likely to do so. So I'm sure you can see that lots of mental ill health conditions um, will be capable of meeting this threshold and hence being defined as a disability. So why is it important to know whether somebody is disabled under the Equality Act or not? Well, 
they are, there are lots of relevant protections that are available to people who are defined as disabled. These range from the direct types of discrimination through to the indirect types of discrimination and discrimination arising in consequence of disability. It also extends to the employer's duty to make reasonable adjustments to the workplace and also it means that individuals are protected against harassment or victimisation in the workplace. It's, it's fairly wide the protections and it also goes beyond that. So associative discrimination is where somebody does not have the disability themselves but is associated with somebody that does. For example, they are a carer for somebody. They will have relevant protections under the Act. And also people are protected um, on a perception basis. So if you are incorrectly perceived to have a disability, for example, a depression illness, you're overlooked for promotion because of that incorrect perception, you will still be protected. There will be protections available to you under the Equality Act. So there's a wide range of protections available um, and it's important to have that in mind when dealing with people who um, are or are linked to people with mental ill health conditions. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in now to talk about um, reasonable adjustments and I'm doing that because it's the one that individuals, managers and HR will most commonly encounter in terms of the practical steps they need to take to comply with legislation when it comes to um, employee mental um, health. Um, also, ACAS very much focuses on reasonable adjustments in their guidance in terms of what employers need to do. So let's look at this in some more detail. Well, what's the purpose of a reasonable adjustment? I would say always keep in mind the purpose of the reasonable adjustment because regardless of how reasonable it is, there's going to be mo no point taking that adjustment if it's not going to achieve the aim. And the aim is to change or adapt the working environment to remove or minimise the impact of the individual's disability. Um, secondly, I've noted that it must be reasonable and in bearing in mind reasonableness, um, thought will be given to the size and the resource of the employer. And I've noted up some examples of possible reasonable adjustments. Um, I should state at this point that there is no exhaustive list of reasonable adjustments. It will always depend on the individual circumstances. But the ones that are, um, that, that are particularly um, prevalent in mental ill health conditions and managing those are flexible working hours, changes to start and finish times, changes to roles even, or redeployment into other roles. And these changes can be temporary or permanent, depending on the circumstances. Another one is moving workplaces, so desk move, or potentially um, home working, or a combination of both. Increased support from their manager, or something more formal, such as additional training, coaching, or mentoring. Um, and also bear in mind adjustments to internal processes. I would say, as an employment practitioner, I most regularly see clients cropping up, um, tri tripping up over issues such as adjustments to internal processes. HR and managers quite understandably stick to policies and procedures, and there's quite often good reasons for doing so. However, sometimes rigidly sticking to these can mean that they're not adjusting the process in a way that would be reasonable under this legislation. So, for example, refusing to allow somebody to bring a companion to a meeting because their statutory right is only for a trade union representative or a fellow colleague. It would be reasonable, for example, depending on the mental or health condition, to allow them to bring a wider category of person, such as a friend or a family member. I'd also flag that lots of these changes wouldn't be costly or time consuming. Lots of them will just require good people management. Um, so it's important that it's likely to be viewed as reasonable, especially if it would have been a free and quite quick adjustment to make. Okay. Moving on to the next slide, um, just looking at the legal liabilities that can arise from breach of legal duties. Um, and supporting mental health in the workplace shouldn't mean fretting about what could go wrong, but this isn't the purpose of um, explaining the liabilities here. But the reality is, is that as well as there being a moral and a business case for supporting mental ill health and mental health in the workplace, there is a legal case. Um, and the fallout is as follows. For breach of health and safety obligations, in, individuals can bring personal injury claims and so the company can face liability from that. If somebody brings a constructive unfair dismissal claim, they could seek compensation and be awarded that if they were successful. Um, and then perhaps the most draconian of the, um, 
of the outcomes is in respect of disability discrimination because no service is needed to bring a disability claim and the compensation is uncapped um, so it can be quite uh, high and also the tribunals can make recommendations and declarations. Um, no employer wants to be on the end of um, one of those outcomes. It's, it's not good for PR purposes and also for financial purposes and employee engagement purposes too. So moving on to some of the practical steps, what are the common causes of mental ill health in the workplace and how do we tackle these? Well, before we get on to that, I would say the good place to start is gathering information. And good sources will depend on your business, but they will include staff turnover data, sickness absence data, and performance data. Gather that, analyse that, see whether there are some trends emerging from it. Okay, in terms of common causes of mental ill health in the workplace. There's lots of examples up on this slide and you can have a look at those afterwards, they're quite detailed, some of them. It's taken uh, mainly from the ACAS guidance and they give some good practical pointers here. I'm just going to pick out a few of these examples to discuss. So the first one is at the top of the slide, unmanageable workloads and demands. And you'll see that one of the potential solutions for this is additional training to start, help staff manage their workload. If what is otherwise a reasonable workload for other people in the organisation and somebody is struggling, a potential solution is to look at additional training or to having the conversation with the individual to see why they're struggling with that workload. That might be a good adjustment to make, it might prevent any mental ill health or support any mental ill health condition that's linked to that. And it's a good solution to um, consider instead of, for example, going straight for a disciplinary or a performance improvement process. Another example is the fourth one down, unhealthy work-life balance, which I think resonates with all of us to some degree. Um, I've, you've seen that the, one of the potential solutions ACAS say is to encourage staff to consider flexible working arrangements. And many employers are a bit hesitant to actually recommend it um, and can see it as a bit of a burden, but I would say bear in mind, is it going to be better to have an employee working flexibly and potentially a few less hours in the week but those hours being productive and fulfilling because it's alleviating some mental ill health or mental stresses for that individual. Another one just to give an example of is organisational change and job security. Um, I've seen many occasions where in large chupies or collective redundancies the staff are not communicated with other than the bare legal minimum. People worry and usually people's worries are a lot worse than the reality and so ACAS recommends that being honest with people even if it's bad news is a good tip and I would definitely agree with that. A lot of people with these big changes in the workplace actually leave even when they're not made redundant or cheapied out because they've been so worried about the process that their mental health has suffered as a result. They've been perhaps job searching elsewhere just because of the lack of communication or the lack um, in, of, of, of consultation with them. Another one that's not on the slide, but I in practice have found this is an issue, is the failure to deal with employees on uh, long-term uh, physical ill health, um, sickness, absence reasons. Um, quite often they can, they can be uh, left by the wayside, the communication um, cannot be great to those individuals, they aren't given the support for their physical ill health issues and reintegration to the workplace. And as a result, mental um, ill health conditions can become overlaid on top of their physical ill health um, conditions, making the problems worse. So I would say it's definitely a cause that I've perceived as being a trigger for mental ill health is those on long-term sickness absence. They think about strategies there. Okay, a few more pointers on practical help. I'm just going to turn to some of the other ACAS recommendations. And they focus around senior managers to champion awareness um, and in particular ACAS say senior managers could be arranging initiatives to promote awareness, perhaps participating in World Mental Health Day, acting as role model for good health behaviours, taking the lunch away from the desk, um, booking holidays etc. And creating an environment of support and open dialogue. So creating the environment where employees know that they can come and speak to you, that they won't be sidelined or fobbed off, that you'll take uh, seriously complaints about stress, anxiety, mental health issues. Um, also ACAS suggests an action plan to change attitudes if your organisation doesn't already have one. So this could include plans as to why the organisation is committed to promoting positive mental health, 
how it's going to measure itself against its objectives, how the organisation will identify and tackle the causes of mental ill health in the workforce, planning a range of activities to educate staff and putting in place support for staff experiencing mental ill health. An action plan could, for example, incorporate support to staff dealing with financial stress, and Hannah will be able to speak on this, and also to educate in the benefits of good nutrition and the role that plays in mental health, which Ali will elaborate on later. Okay, the next ACAS pointer is to educate the workforce, so to train managers to deal with mental ill health and all of their staff in awareness generally. I'd say this is a really easy and quick one to achieve. Um, we at Clarkson Eagle have done lots of training for employers over the years and in particular recently in relation to um, supporting mental health in the workplace. It gives managers a toolkit really that they need to deal with and tackle mental ill health and supporting health issues in their day-to-day -day, um, lives as managers. Another point ACAS um, want to bear in mind is that the that organisations should be creating mental health policies. Again, you may already have one. You might have a stress policy that could be easily adapted, for example. But these policies would contain things such as positive commitments to mental health and tackling the causes of mental ill health, encouraging an environment where people can talk openly. The requirement, it could stipulate that there's a requirement for mental health training um, to be ha had by managers. It could detail your support service, employee assistance programmes, etc. Um, and also it could set out a process, a typical process for the reintegration of staff who've been absent from work owing to mental ill health. You might already have them for physical ill health conditions, it might be quite similar in your mental um, health policy. And also the policy can signpost to further support and information. There's lots of great resources out there including ACAS and MIND um, and it could just signpost to those places. So, finally, just to draw some conclusions, I've mentioned that as well as there being the moral case and the legal case, there is the business case. Um, and I find, I find it quite interesting to see lots of the studies that have been done on this. In particular, uh, Deloitte have undertake, uh, undertaken much analysis on those who have invested in supporting mental health in the workplace, and they found consistently positive returns in investment financially on measures that employers take. In particular, the Lancet study, um, that was, the study that was published in the Lancet is quite interesting. That is in relation to the Australian Fire Service. They had their managers attend mental health training and they calculated that for every one pound uh, that was spent on training, it reduced sickness absence for mental ill health reasons by 10 pounds. So quite interesting to see that there's some measurable objectives um, there. Finally, I mentioned that I think that as organisations we are going to be pushed to um, comply more with and engage more with the, uh, supportive mental ill health in the, work, in the workplace. And this is because people are losing their jobs at three times the rate for mental ill health reasons versus physical ill health reasons. And the government wants to tackle that and bring that down to the same level within three years, so quite ambitious. There's also quite wide-ranging recommendations made in the Stevenson and Farmer Review. That includes it making it mandatory on government tenders to publicise publicise what you're doing as an organisation to support mental um, health in your organisation. Um, and also there's suggestion even that the Companies Act be amended to make it mandatory to report on mental ill health initiatives. Finally, I would say, what are, what are other comp companies doing? What are your competitors are doing? Well, 11% of companies are already reporting voluntarily on what they're doing in terms of mental health support initiatives. Um, and so employers would generally be very well advised to engage now in supporting mental ill health in the workplace if they're not already doing so. This trend is likely to continue as a good theme for the government to follow up on because it's interesting to note that overall over the last nine years um, absence for physical ill health reasons has fallen but for mental ill health reasons it's actually risen by five percent as there's definitely a uh, government incentive to tackle that. So on that note that, that leaves me to conclude uh, my part of the presentation and I'm going to hand over now over to Hannah to talk about financial stress and productivity. Thank you Lisa. So how financially savvy are you? Can you explain the difference between a defined benefit, 
scheme versus a final salary pension scheme versus workplace savings. How stressed out are your employees? Are they losing sleep in relation to thinking about their finances? Um, this session is focusing on one aspect of potentially mental health and stress in the workplace. Um, I'm looking today uh, to give you some practical tips in terms of uh, addressing financial stress in the workplace. Now, my name is Hannah Dolding. I work for a company called Matty Ovi Woods. Um, we've been helping employers put in place financial education for staff for 25 odd years, right from director level down to um, the, the workers that you've got in your workplace who are trying to make ends meet and physically um, are living hand to mouth. So um, I guess where we actually set ourselves apart um, and how we can support employers is that we provide um, financially authorised consultants who are able to communicate staff and, and dispel some of the jargon um, that you do tend to get in the workplace, especially when talking about financial um, products and employee benefits in general. So this session is very much focused on the impact um, of financial stress in the workplace and the impact on productivity. Um, within the session, I'm going to highlight some useful um, and low-cost tools that are available to you and your employees and dispel some of the myths that there are um, when talking about um, financial planning um, in the workplace. So just to think about um, the pillars of well-being, we're all very familiar with physical, social, career and community, um, but it is becoming more and more apparent um, that financial stress is actually causing a very big proportion um, of potentially mental stress and absenteeism in the workplace. Some really frightening stats um, on the slide that are coming through. Um, one in three people at some point in the last year um, will have lost sleep at some point worrying about their finances. Now that could be um, as, as basic as making ends meet um, or it could be simply trying to remortgage a house or it could be, oh my gosh, I don't know how much I need to, to live on in retirement and I never really thought about it. So if one in three people are, are losing sleep, the impact on their actual capability in the workplace, in, in the workplace is massive. Why do we care? Well, again, looking at the stats, um, you know, in the UK, if you're believing um, what's coming through now, we could potentially be losing up to £120 billion pounds worth um, of productivity on the economy due to this stress, due to financial stress in the workplace. If you're not getting the best out of your employees, then we all know that's actually hitting your bottom line. And actually, there's some very, very simple things to help support people. Um, we've all got different generations, and you'll all have different demographics within your um, workplace. Um, the younger generations coming into the workplace now uh, are struggling because they're coming in with a massive amount of financial debt, um, potentially from university or further education. Um, your older workforce um, and the shift away from the more traditional defined benefit, you know, the guaranteed income in retirement, um, to workplace savings where there's just literally a pot of money um, that you and, and the staff put money into. Um, that shift and focus and, and ownership pressure that's put onto people um, throughout their working careers uh, means that actually I, you need to really start thinking about the tools and the support that you're giving staff. Um, you know, everybody wants higher wages. Um, we all get that in our own workspace. Um, there aren't endless budgets. You do need to have, um, you know, your employees working at maximum power. And if they're stressed about something that they literally can't afford to live um, or they don't know what's going to happen in the next few years, um, then ultimately, again, simple tools to help them take ownership of that. Um, is, is really you know, the first steps to making sure that they're not stressing out in the workplace. So what can you do? Now, the first step is really measure your staff. So again, we work three different, um, three different businesses around this table here. We all have very different demographics. At Matioli Woods, we have you know, shy of 600 employees, a lot coming through university uh, and into the workplace through our apprenticeship schemes. 
Um, you know, these people are trying hard to make ends meet, but hopefully are quite financially savvy. Um, but finding out actually how financially savvy is a really important aspect. Um, so ask them. Simple, simple surveys are out there. The um, Public Health England have an off-the-shelf survey um, to help you measure um, the actual overall health and well-being across your workforce. So it's free, you can download it off their website. Um, we'll hear from Ali um, from Super Wellness about some simple steps around getting um, the physical aspects of nutrition, um, you know, workshops that can help people understand the real impacts of good nutrition on their physical and mental health, health and well-being. Obviously at Matty Woods, our focus is on helping address the financial aspects. So um, making sure you understand how financially savvy they are by asking a few simple questions such as, you know, do you know how, um, how the benefits work? Um, what's your understanding in relation to the employee benefits that are provided? Do they understand um, how to pay off bad debt? That kind of thing. Um, asking very simple questions and we can help you put together surveys to structure um, you know, the measurement aspect of it and then actually look at tailoring a support package around that. Um, so the second aspect here I would say um, is one aspect is certainly essential and, and we've heard from Anita as well. Um, as part of your basic health and safety duties you need to ensure you've got an employee assistance programme in place so that people can phone that in times of stress. Now. You may actually, through your employee benefit package, have a lot of different employee assistance programmes and actually understanding which are the better ones out there, again, is something that you can do by simply interrogating your suppliers um, or, again, working with a firm such as ourselves to um, analyse and audit the capability of each of those programmes. Getting essential MI, or management information, from those packages um, will, again, help you tailor uh, a good financial um, health and wellbeing strategy around that. And then simply the third aspect of um, putting in place a process to help address financial stress in the workplace is actually then putting the project plans in place. So if you do have a lot of um, you know, university graduates coming out um, of, or coming into your workspace, um, there is an aspect of demographic there that basic financial education can help these guys put in place a plan for themselves. Um, if you've got uh, an ageing demographic, dare I say it, <laughs> um, within your workforce, so again helping them understand what they may have built up in terms of pension provisions and when they can access that and the flexibilities they have as well um, is, is a really essential part of, of looking after um, your staff um, and helping them help themselves. We all know that uptake doesn't drive engagement. You just need to look at auto-enrolment into pension schemes to understand that. We might have 90% uptake, but does anybody understand it? No. Um, we're in a, well, some of us do, hopefully. Um, but we're in the phase, of, particularly around auto-enrolment, where people are um, starting to take notice. They're starting to um, look at the statements that they're getting through and they're starting to ask questions of their employers as to how do we access this? What does it actually mean? Am I saving enough? Financial education helps your employees understand um, everything around the financial planning and what they need to do to help themselves. Um, now I'm an advocate of Money Savings Expert which is a great website where people can get some really simple clear understanding of how you know things like debt management works um, really really useful websites it's important to point them in the direction um, of useful tools that are unbiased in that context um, we at Matty Early Woods as well can help work in your workplace um, and communicate with staff and show people how they can access um, you know support and help helplines when needed um, I think most importantly across every generation we are seeing an absolute drive for face-to-face, face-to-face help. Everything's online these days. Your employee benefit package, you make your selections online. Um, actually, when it comes to talking about um, financial um, products and helping relieve some of the financial stress, people just want to bounce things off you. So again, making sure you have regular sessions in your workplace um, that enables people to uh, you know, ask the questions that they have, dispel some of the myths, through the financial jargon 
um, and just basically put in place a plan for themselves will really help. And tailoring the message is really important. Um, words such as pension uh, have negative connotations and actually don't these days tend to actually explain to people uh, what is actually meant by that word. So to give you an example, most people are automatically enrolled into a workplace savings scheme. The concept of a savings plan is much easier for people to understand. Pension is very negative. So again, getting the language right across the different generations is an essential part of uh, financial education workshops. Um, removing all of that jargon, again, really important to do in order that you don't lose an audience. And that's why you need experts like ourselves to help um, your employees get what they need out of the sessions. How many of you can explain what um, each and every entry is on your payslip and actually be able to calculate it longhand? Now that's something I can do, but you would hope that would be the case as I am a financial advisor. Um, but actually a lot of people don't understand the difference between gross pay and take-home pay. Um, some people don't understand what deduction is or don't really understand what income tax is or national insurance. Um, having, again, a focus using your own payslips in, in workshops where you explain how it all works is a really good way to engage staff. You know, ultimately, for most employers, the wage bill is the most expensive piece um, of your budget. Uh, so if people don't understand it, then you're not maximising value from it. Helping people who are a bit confused about finances. Now, Again, having financial education, ideally we would all have that in schools, but we don't. Um, there are a lot of people in the workforce who uh, don't understand basic budget planning. Um, and again, simple workshops can help people, again, put their own plan in place. And we have people with light bulb moments out of our sessions going, I just didn't understand it and now I really do. Again, getting the jargon out of the um, dialogue is, is absolutely essential. I've got some key examples here um, when talking about workplace savings. Um, the key questions we get from people are, should I transfer my previous plan? How much should I save? And what will I get? So again, pointing them in the direction of useful websites, and that could be from your workplace savings provider, um, or again, money savings experts. Um, is a really good way to make sure that they can help learn for themselves. Um, if you're happy enough to have consultants come into the workspace and help point people in the right direction as well and help people understand and become educated around financial uh, benefits, then that's the way you're getting the best um, value from your spend as well. So, why should you do it? Well, I hope we've explained today um, the impact on productivity is massive. So if you have people who are losing sleep, um, you're not maximising your spend on those people. Um, if you've got employees who are stressed out because they cannot afford to live or they cannot get on the property ladder, then giving them some helpful tools and some helpful pointers um, will empower them and it will engage them ultimately and hopefully then over time you will end up getting the maximum value from those people. So how can we help? Well as I've explained um, we can provide financial education in the workplace, we can help you review your employee assistance programs and your health and wellbeing strategies. Um, if you don't know what you've got in place and you're not maximising the best out of it then how are your employees going to do that? So we would love a conversation with you um, if you think that would be of help to you. Our contact details are on the slide. I'm going to hand over now to Ali um, from our colleagues at Super Wellness, who's going to explain a bit about um, the nutritional aspects of dealing with mental health in the workplace. Thank you, Hannah. So... I'm Ali Prentice and I'm from Super Wellness. We are a company who provide nutrition-centred wellbeing services to companies and corporates. And our aim really is twofold. It's to help both the companies um, increase productivity, which we've already touched on as being very important in terms of thinking about wellbeing in the, in the workplace. And secondly, and importantly, helping people get 
uh, really practical tips so that employees can learn to how to help themselves and make positive changes to their own health. Uh, I just want to say that we are all at Super Wellness properly qualified uh, nutritional therapists and we all have experience of the corporate world so this actually helps us when we're in conversation with clients because we understand the barriers and the issues that people face um, in terms of bringing nutrition in and helping people to actually make the right choices uh, with their diet and lifestyle. So I think more and more people are thinking about nutrition in the workplace but it is still quite an untapped area and uh, we have started talking about the nutrition gap. So that's really the opportunity of thinking about how um, initiatives, education and awareness around nutrition and lifestyle can actually bring benefits into the workplace. Uh, what we know is, from the experience we've had with different clients, that just making small changes on certain um, nutrition habits can actually have a really big impact so people start to feel better. And when that happens, then they have conversations with their peers in the workplace, and that actually starts to have a real ripple effect. But it doesn't stop within the confines of the organisation itself. Obviously, people take that newfound awareness and knowledge and enthusiasm home with them, and they share their ideas and um, new recipes and practical tips with families and with their friends. So there's a, there is a real ripple effect that goes outwards. But it isn't just the employees who can stand to gain, as we've already mentioned. Um, it is also the, the employer themselves that can, that can actually uh, stand to gain. What we do know is that uh, mental health actually constitutes the largest reason for sickness absence in the UK. And um, obviously, to be able to tackle that in some way is going to be very, very beneficial, we've heard about. It isn't just the employees that can benefit, it is also the companies as well and we can see how um, productivity can increase by making some nutrition changes in the workplace. This next slide actually shows how um, a study by the um, Brigham Young University found that um, an unhealthy diet could actually be contributing to a decrease in productivity and this impact might actually be as much as 66%. So if you a company was able to sort of shave away at that um, inefficiency by making some changes in workplace well-being, this could be of great benefit. Now a little bit of food for thought here. I think we can see in, in the industry now that people are starting to think about nutrition in the workplace, but they're perhaps not making the connection between nutrition and mental well-being. It's more around energy, it might be about weight loss, it might be about certain specific dis disease prevention, but not necessarily about mental well-being. And what I wanted to just remind everybody really is that um, mental health actually is the largest reason for sickness absence in the UK. So to be able to reduce that in some shape or form is obviously going to be beneficial. We also know that from studies, from scientific studies, that those people who have most recently reported some problem with their mental health are much less likely to be eating those all-important fruit and vegetables. So less than half of them are likely to be doing that on a regular basis. Compared to people who don't report mental health issues, they are more likely to be eating, uh, two-thirds of those are more likely to be eating more fruit and vegetables. So my, why might this be the case? If we just take a very quick look at a little bit of the biology of the brain, it just starts to give us some ideas for why nutrition has such an impact. So first of all, if we look at brain composition, and then we look at a little bit at brain function, in terms of comp composition, you can see on that pie chart that actually water is the last, largest component of our brains. So making sure that employees have really good access to hydration throughout the day and encouragement to do that can have a really beneficial effect on their cognitive performance. Then if we also look at the dry weight of the brain, we find that actually 66% of the dry weight is made up of fats. Now over the last few decades, we've been rather fat phobic and people really make quite a conscious effort to avoid fats but we shouldn't be avoiding all of those fats in our diet. In fact, there are some very essential fats that we need and healthy fats that we should be eating on a regular basis. 
One of those fats are the omega-3 essential fats that we do hear a lot about. So they are from oily fish and nuts and seeds predominantly. It's very important that we have those for our health generally, but for our brain cells it's important because the omega-3s keep those cell membranes fluid and functioning properly. And this means that actually in terms of communication between nerve cells in the brain, those will be working more efficiently and effectively if we have omega-3 in those membranes. Now the brain also is very greedy for fuel. It's actually obviously using a lot of energy as we, as we work during the day. And therefore it's very important that we provide the energy, preferred energy source to the brain, which is glucose. And that it comes through in the blood sugar. But what we don't want to be having throughout the day, and we don't definitely see this when we talk to employees, is those peaks and troughs that people have. They feel like they need a bit of a boost in the morning, they have a sugary donut, they have a cup of coffee to get themselves going. And that's great for a little while, and then they have that all-important crash afterwards where they feel hungry, tired, hangry, grumpy, and they fall, start again and, and reach for the wrong foods, um, high-release carbohydrate, fast-release carbohydrate foods. So a steady supply of um, blood sugar is important for the brain, but you don't be wanting them to have those peaks and troughs. So it's important to really help employees understand what's happening in their bodies and how it can affect their minds. But it's not just the brain that we look at. Um, in nutrition, we also consider um, not just the diet, we, we consider uh, lifestyle issues as well. And so things like sleep and relaxation are incredibly important for mental health. But another area that's becoming more and more interesting is the relationship between our guts and our minds and our brains. And there is real communication that happens through something called the vagus nerve, which can affect our mood and um, various uh, brain chemicals called neuro neurotransmit neurotransmitters. So uh, that's, that's an area I think that we're going to hear more and more about in the future. So just going back to mental health uh, in the workplace, we've already heard um, that ACAS has listed a number of workplace risks, and I've got a little list here. But I've highlighted a couple of things that aren't on that list. So for instance, um, the fact that people in office jobs tend to sit down for such a long while, and we're now seeing that um, uh, sitting is the new smoking in terms of the health risks that it brings, and it also does affect mood as well. Um, and lack of daylight is, is, is another key thing as well. Uh, we know that vitamin D is very important for our health generally, and getting out into daylight allows us to manufacture that an important vitamin D. So half people say that when they're stressed they actually eat unhealthily, and um, in contrast 55% of people say that they actually do feel better when they eat healthily. So there seems to be a strong correlation there. So in terms of looking at what we call the nutrition advantage, uh, it does represent a, a really sort of easy and gentle way of bringing in um, the idea of improvements around uh, mental well-being. What we know is that men in particular uh, will attribute stress and their mental health to uh, what's going on at work rather than what's necessarily happening in their outside life. But we also know that they're less likely to talk about it or to go to the doctor and, and seek medical advice about it. So if you imagine coming in and running some sort of um, engaging activity around nutrition that explains how um, a good diet and lifestyle can affect mood, um, cognitive um, wellness and performance, how that might be just an easy way of introducing that uh, conversation and some improvements in the, in the um, workplace around mental health. For instance, uh, one of the stress hormones that we release when we're uh, sort of feeling under pressure over a long period of time is called cortisol. And uh, having high levels of cortisol over a long extended period of time is not good for our bodies at all. But going out into green surroundings for as little as 10 minutes has been shown to significantly reduce those cortisol levels. So this is something we're now calling uh, vitamin N or vitamin nature. It's just you know how powerful that can be. 
So in terms of really capitalising on the nutrition advantage, it's important to think about what you want to do strategically. So we've heard already about the importance of, of policies and thinking about um, uh, mental wellness in the workplace and the financial side as well. So nutrition can fit in with the general wellbeing strategy that you have in place and can be part of that policy making as well. It's important to plan for success and it's important to be patient because these changes do take time. So in terms of looking at uh, a strategy for success then, uh, if you're putting a nutrition programme in place, it's very much like it would be if you're putting any other programme of work in to an organisation. First of all, you need to start at the top and think about what the challenges are that you're facing, what you're wanting to address, so therefore what the goals are that you're setting yourself in this space. And importantly, right in the early stages, it's important to think about some key performance indicators, things that you know you can measure uh, to see whether you're actually having any impact on the things you want to change. We've already mentioned as well how different companies and organisations have very different demographics and environments and these will have different pressures on both the opportunities you have within the nutrition space and also the challenges you have in terms of getting um, in touch with people and getting them in involved. So think about all of those. Another important factor, I think, in setting everything up properly is to make sure that you do have leadership support. So Anita was already talking about how important it is to sort of lead from the top and in terms of workplace, uh, work-life balance to sort of demonstrate um, that and perhaps not eating al desco every day. <laughs> but we find when we have enthusiastic leaders um, supporting and leading by example with their own nutrition, we really get a, a lot more sort of uptake and stickiness within the organisation. But on the other side, it's um, also important to, to get people involved, so to get the grassroots people involved as well. Um, I don't want people watching this video thinking that they necessarily have to own everything, put everything into place themselves. Um, by finding early adopters and people who have good networks, uh, people who are enthusiastic supporters, you can actually um, cut your own workload way down and get those people involved and they'll do a lot of work for you. And then think about where the quick wins are, go for those, and then trial some of your ideas to, to, to prove your, con, your uh, proof of concept and um, make sure that you're doing that measurement throughout. So this slide, uh, multiple touch points, shows a number of different types of uh, initiatives that you can introduce within an organisation with relation to nutrition interventions. Um, I think my top tip really would be to try and make sure that you use as many different types of interventions as you can. Hannah was talking very much about the idea of intervention um, and engagement and it's very true in the nutrition area. You know, you can't just go out and start trying to just tell people what to do without really trying to capture their hearts and minds. And some of these face-to-face -face, um, workshops or presentations obviously give that um, much more as an opportunity, but in some environments where you've got a very distributed workforce, uh, meeting up face-to-face -face is just not possible. And that's where more remote uh, forms of communication can come into play, as well as using tech. So, you know, people tend to have their own fitness trackers and things like that. There are apps and, and so on out there as well that can be utilised. So just to finalise on maximising engagement, because this is a pet topic of mine, having worked previously uh, for many decades in employee engagement, communication and business change management, I know just how important it is. So I would just encourage anybody thinking of doing something in the nutrition space to really try and be a bit creative and to make whatever they're doing sort of fun, energetic, and to perhaps introduce some level of competition. We'll look at that in just the next slide. But I think by um, some of the techniques that we use, we sort of demystify the science. So we'll use terms like mind melters or brain boosters just to sort of help people really understand um, you know that these things are real and can, and can work for them and then importantly we always make sure that we get really really practical ideas so going back to those omega-3 fats 
you know, giving people practical tips on how perhaps they can boost their, their level of omega-3 intake. So it might be as simple as having uh, just a small bag of nuts and seeds um, that they can use as a handful uh, every day for snacks during the day, or it might be sprinkling something like linseeds or chia seeds on top of their normal porridge or yogurt in the morning. So it's really bringing those things to life for people to maximise the engagement. Now I mentioned competition a minute ago. This is just a quick case study uh, from P&O Ferries. And we ran something called our three month challenge with them as a pilot. And what we had there were teams, four teams of employees who were all um, wanting to uh, understand their body health metrics they uh, filled out a well-being survey and questionnaire at the beginning to give a benchmark of where they were in terms of their sleep, their stress resilience or their energy. And over the months, we went in and we gave them um, health coaching. We tracked their body metrics in terms of uh, body fat, muscle mass, metabolic age and visceral fat and so on. And gave them lots of ideas and hints and tips. And they also supported each other. But importantly, what were the results from this particular challenge? Well, the main reason that we were brought in was because um, absent sickness costs were spiralling upwards. And what we found was that after the uh, duration of the challenge, that the monthly cost of over three, th th sorry, over 13,000 pounds was slashed right down to only 150 in one month. And uh, we also found that the uh, statistics and the um, self-reported wellness uh, tracker from the employees was, was very significant too. So you can see there that sleep improved by 20%, 20 energy levels were up by a quarter, and people also felt they were able to deal with stress better. So those were the things that the, the employees who attended the challenge themselves benefited, benefited from. But there was also a real level of positive engagement generally. So those people that weren't part of the challenge were talking much more amongst themselves about how important nutrition was. The chefs on board, I think, were making changes to the um, menus that were offered to the employees, etc. And I'm pleased to say that we're now, uh, the, the plan is to roll uh, the challenge out across all of the fairies. So where, where are you when you're sitting watching this, um, this video? Are you feeling sort of that you're rather on your own? When we go into companies, we tend to find that there's generally only one or perhaps two people thinking about well-being in a company. Um, and it could be quite a lonely place. So what we've done is we've set up an online community for uh, decision makers in the well-being space so that they can get together and actually swap ideas between themselves and share best practice and so on. But the members um, within this group also have a number of benefits that we offer to, to you as well. So first of all, I just wanted to hold up this report here. It's a 40 page report and it's full of statistics, um, hints and tips, case studies, and it also has a uh, self-completion uh, survey in there for um, assessing your own um, nutrition savvy or nutrition smartness um in your company. So you can fill that out yourself. We also provide an electronic copy of um, this calendar, which lists all the um, health and well-being days that are held nationally. So what we find is a very powerful way of timing what you do in the workplace is to take advantage of what's happening in the media generally, in the public space, and um, piggybacking on that. So uh, we mentioned Mental Health Day, for instance. You might be wanting to do something around that. This calendar actually has all those dates in there. Um, we also provide an option to uh, trial our uh, new super wellness app for 12 months for up to 10 people in the organisation. Um, there's a 50% discount voucher as well for a half day session with super wellness. So nothing to be lost, do come on board if you feel you want to. Uh, the contact details as Hannah and uh, Anita said are actually on the slides. So very, very quickly, let's just summarise what the opportunities are for you to actually bring nutrition in um, and use it in the, the mental wellness space. Um, it can help to decrease uh, presenteeism, which is a real problem, uh, as well as absence and healthcare costs. 
Um, you will generate, if you've done it right, you'll generate um, a real level of buzz and conversation and a lot of goodwill, which um, you know sets you up as a, an employer of choice, which can also then help you beat the competition in terms of uh, recruitment and retention. It's very much about doing the right thing in the 21st century, but it is more than that. And um, simple changes, as I mentioned before, can actually have a large impact. And I just wanted to finish on um, a, a statement that was made by Dr. Andrew McCulloch, who was a former CEO of the Mental Health Foundation. And he said that nutrition should become a mainstay, everyday component of mental health um, care. And I would just argue that that's not true in society generally. That also does stand in the workplace as well. Thank you very much. Thank you both. And that just leaves me to thank you for joining us for the webinar today. If we have any queries on the topics we've discussed today, we'd all be very happy to have an initial chat with you. Please do get in touch. Our details are on the slides, as we've mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.